Good evening and welcome to tonight's Lovetown celebration. We want to reflect with you tonight on the meaning of 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. We want to do that in conversation about love as it works itself out in community. We also want to do that through celebrating the visual arts and through hearing the love chapter read to us in multiple languages. Love is the first great commandment. It's also the second great commandment, love for God and love for neighbor. Let's begin our time tonight together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we give you praise that your love is the first love. You tell us in your word, it's not that we first loved you, it's that you first loved us. And more than that, you have given yourself to us in Jesus through his death and through his resurrection. We give you praise. Your love is not just the first love, it is the forever love, the love that will never let us go, the love that will last for all eternity. And so we rejoice tonight, Father, in your love. And we pray by the power and presence of your spirit that we might have more of your love in our lives, more love for you and more love for our neighbors. This we pray as we dedicate this evening's program to you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the summer of 2010, uh, artist Gene Schmidt was inspired by a message from the Bible on love from 1 Corinthians 13. Since Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love, I wanted to connect it somehow with, with that theme. And so pretty much the first thing that came to mind was, was 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, news of the original installation first came to me actually through President Phil Riken of Wheaton College. He was preaching on a series from 1 Corinthians 13. And to me it was very exciting because I was trying to show the relevance of God's Word for our lives as we were living and serving and working and worshiping in Philadelphia. And uh, here Gene was going to bring that in an artistic way and really say this biblical text is for you living today in this city. His book, which is actually just released, called Loving the Way Jesus Loves. And so on it he actually uses imagery from the Philadelphia installation. Most of the books I write uh, do not give me an opportunity to collaborate with artists, so it's been very exciting to work with Jean Schmidt and also with Alicia Hansen, her beautiful photographs of Jean's art installation. Well, so when I was in Philly doing the project, um, uh, Dr. Riken, who was at the time pastor of 10th Presbyterian there in Philadelphia, he found out about the project through a mutual friend. Now that he, you know, that he's the president here, uh, we were able to arrange an exhibition and kind of connect it with the, the release of his book. The Lovetown Project uh, activities include uh, a number of community art projects. Most notably is our sweatshirt workshop. So we're going out with a blank canvas and we're letting people etch themselves in the letters of love from uh, this passage in their own language, it's their own message, and it's among their neighbors. Uh, we're taking that to places like Windsor Park Retirement Community. We're taking it to uh, the grade school kids that come for the Community School of the Arts music lessons on campus. 
We're certainly doing it on campus. I mean, we are really using voices from the community. For instance, Mayor Gresk of Wheaton will be speaking on what it means to love your neighbor. Hopefully I can bring some, some historical perspective and also some uh, uh, civic, uh, a, a, a communal sense here too. I truly believe something like this can only improve uh, the quality of life that we enjoy in our town, which I think is, 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 is at a pretty high level already. And, and by, by doing this, we, I, I think we can, we will, uh, for the better, crank things up a notch, and it'll, it'll be that much better because of it. I think students are really interested um, in a lot of different aspects. I think nothing else more than just getting art here on campus, which is just nice. Um, I think having a creative outlet is needed for a lot of students, and they don't really have that chance to do that. So I think the sweatshirts was really fun just because it gave students an hour or two just to be creative. One of my hopes in bringing Lovetown to Wheaton's campus is to help our students see one example of using the visual arts to display something beautiful but also to display something meaningful that comes out of the Christian faith and really challenge us, challenges us to live our Christian faith. Loving your neighbor is really, really hard, <laughs> for one thing, and I think, and, you know, the, the project kind of reflects that in a, in a way. I mean, it was, uh, I tried to make it physically difficult, you know, for me to do, because it kind of parallels how difficult that kind of love is. My dearest hope is that we'll get to know each other better. I, mean, I think our neighbors want to know how to love us better too. Um, it's a great universal calling that, um, that is pointed out in this text of scripture, uh, but really appeals to the deeper parts of all of us as humans. You know, I, you know, I know for a fact that there are, there are still people hurting out there that, you know, that need our help here immediately in our, you know, you know, in our town and, and the charitable works, the good works, um, you know, that brotherly love, uh, I think hopefully will, will be uh, increased um, by this, uh, by this uh, program. You know, when I did the project in Philly, I had, I had in mind what I wanted to do, and I felt like the, the text is so strong and can kind of speak for itself, that really what I did is I just, I took it there, I set it out, and then I just saw what happened. You know, I kind of let, I let the text do the talking. And so I would say, you know, for this installation here in Wheaton, uh, I, I like to leave it really open for people to respond to however they want to, and different people are going to respond in different ways. That's certainly what happened in Philly, and I think the same thing will happen here. I mean, I, I hope that people, I mean, certainly the text, you know, there's so much in the text. There's profound lessons to be learned in the text. I'm not, I'm not coming as some kind of teacher to try and teach anybody about love through this project, uh, but, but those lessons are in there for people to find. My hope is that not only will we seek to love our neighbors better through art, this medium that we're using for Love Town, but through many other ways. Anything to get you into a new relationship where you can discover the needs of those around you. O amor é sofredor, é benigno, o amor não é invejoso, o amor não trata com leviandade, não se ensorbece, não se porta com indecência, não busca os seus interesses, não se irrita, não suspeita mal, não folga com a injustiça, mas folga com a verdade. Tudo sofre, tudo crê, tudo espera, tudo suporta.
seven pounds that weighed 1,600 pounds across six miles over 12 days and four trips to Chile. Why on earth <laughs> did you do that? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, somebody asked a similar question about a previous project in New York, and my answer was, uh, some things just need to be done. And uh, that's kind of a smart aleck answer, but uh, in a way it's true. Um, I mean, essentially, I, you know, I was invited there by a, a gallery in Philadelphia to propose a project, um, and I, uh, I find it hard to resist an invitation to <laughs> To, to do an art project, and so I, I went ahead and did it. And it, the thing with this opportunity was um, there was a real, uh, I had kind of a personal connection with Philadelphia. I mean, I grew up not far from Philadelphia. Um, I knew people in Philadelphia. I knew people who exhibit the kind of love that Paul talks about, who are doing great work in Philadelphia. Um, uh, my, uh, my father uh, passed away uh, 23 years ago uh, in a hospital in Philadelphia, and I wanted to pay tribute to him, and so that became part of, uh, part of the project as well. And um, in fact, that's, you know, I, I kind of built the project around cer certain locations, uh, starting out at this uh, Crossroads Community Center where a woman that I know from my home church has worked for many, many years with children and just exemplifies every day this mm -hmm. kind of love. And so that became my starting point. Uh, and, uh, and I worked my way through you know, Love Park, where Robert Indiana's love sculpture is, and then on to the University of Pennsylvania uh, Hospital where my father died. And, and um, so that kind of became you know, the reason I went where I went. Um, so even though that had nothing to do with the invitation to do something in Philadelphia, it became a very personal project for me and um, and uh, you know a way to a way for me to meditate on on this passage you know I, I went I went to learn something from it and from the city uh, of Philadelphia uh, I didn't I think maybe I mentioned this in the in the video that I didn't go as a, as a teacher but I went to learn love lessons for myself because uh, because you know I, I, I need I think we probably all, I can't speak for everybody, but I think we all need more lessons about that kind of love. I think you can speak for everybody. <laughs> uh, I imagine you came across uh, a wide range of people and neighborhoods. Uh, I'm curious, did, did you find that people responded differently in different neighborhoods? Yeah. Um, yeah, there was definitely a difference. We started in a very low-income neighborhood um, which was just alive with activity, uh, a lot of kids playing out on the, you know, out on the sidewalk, and, and people just tended to, to live out on their stoops, you know, it was, it was warm, it was hot actually, um, and, uh, and so it, people kind of just automatically became very engaged with the project as it came through. You know, I, did, I didn't announce ahead of time really that I was coming, um, so all of a sudden this thing shows up, you know, at their doorstep, literally, and uh, so people were out asking questions and, and uh, uh, you know, were very, very engaged with it. Um, and that, that did change as we went through the different neighborhoods in the city, uh, as we got into more of the uh, downtown business district. Um, you know, we were passing in front of mainly uh, storefronts and businesses, so more uh, suspicion and, mm -hmm. and like, you know, How's this going to affect my brand, and uh, you know that sort of those sort of concerns, um, and then you know some more affluent areas. It just wasn't there. Just wasn't that kind of street life that we found uh, up in North Philadelphia, and um, yeah, Philadelphia is a neighborhood, uh, a city of neighborhoods, and, and each each one has kind of a distinctive feel. So there was certainly a different response. Uh, we're looking at pictures from the project. Many of these are up around campus. Uh, and I've seen some photos of you, Gene. So you obviously didn't do this alone. Um, 
I wonder if you could tell us about uh, the process through this project in particular of the artistic collaboration of your team. Yeah, sure. Um, I had uh, two people with me. Uh, Alicia Hansen, who's uh, a great photographer, came along and took all these images that you're seeing now. And uh, then also Johnny Gerhardt uh, came and, and was shooting video the whole time. Um, the video, uh, we're, you know, we intend to make a, a documentary film about the project. We're still, um, you know, trying to raise funds to, to get that edited and finish that film. Um, so if anybody's had a dream of being an ex executive producer, now's your big chance, right? Uh, but um, you're pointing to somebody. Uh, so um, yeah, so what you see in the what you'll see in the museum if you go over there afterwards uh, is is Alicia's work. Uh, her her photographs are on display in the museum, and so the collaboration between the three of us is, was very important because you know if you're doing a, a project like this out on the street, you know obviously I can't I can't document it. Um, even if I could, I, I you know I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to do it as as well as as these two and. And so I was very fortunate. I'm very fortunate to have to have them along on uh, on my projects, and uh, it gives it gives the project a whole other life that it wouldn't have otherwise. Um, you know, out on the street, it's just basically for people who happen to be passing by, and um, and that's I mean that's an important part. That's the essential part. But then you know I wanted it to have a life beyond that, and uh, and for people who weren't there to be able to. To connect to it and to share in the project, so um, it's it's it was, it was a vital, a vital part of the project was the collaboration. Right. Mm -hmm. um, your team's together again here in Chicago. Yeah. You have anything lined up? <laughs> yeah, I have. Uh, uh, I well, I I do have a project lined up um, while we're here, uh, close to Chicago. We're actually going into Chicago. Um, tomorrow evening, and so Thursday and probably into Friday, we're going to sneak in a little uh, mini project in Chicago uh, on the um, on the Magnificent Mile. So um, we'll see how that goes. I mean, it's all, when we when we do these projects, you never know what's going to happen. Um, I, the project is I'm calling it the Magnificat Mile, and I'm taking a line from the Magnificat and taking it up and down the Magnificent Mile. Um, so similar kind of, it's a much shorter project, but a similar idea of just taking a text, putting it out there, and, and kind of seeing how people respond to it, seeing what happens. Um, you know, beyond that, I'm, I, I'm always thinking of ideas. I've got, you know, three or four fully formed projects in my mind, <laughs> and uh, which, you know, if I had uh, uh, funding and permission to go ahead with, I could start next week, you know? And, if my wife was here to hear that, she would be standing up right now and saying, you will not start a project next week. But, uh, um, but you know, theoretically, I could. So um, yeah, I, I always have ideas going on. Uh, but I, I can't talk about those now sure. before I do. <laughs> uh, from what I've seen of your recent work, uh, Scripture is heavenly involved. Uh, of course, in this one, it's all based on a passage from 1 Corinthians 13. Um, clearly, faith is a part of your work. Uh, I think we'd all like to hear a little bit more about that connection. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, short answer would be that faith is certainly central to my work. Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, if you've, if you've been paying attention at all to the, to the conversation that is going on in, in Christian art circles, a lot of people are talking about, um, they'll use the term, the intersection of, of faith and art. Uh, and uh, you know, there's conferences about the intersection of faith and art, and artists will say, I work at the intersection of faith and art. It seems like a lot of people are gathering at the intersection of faith and art. And, um, I, I live in New York City, and when a lot of people gather in intersections, we call that gridlock. Um, so it might be time for a traffic cop at the intersection. Um, and you know, but I, I understand what they're saying. I, I, that you know, they're talking about where the two overlap. Uh, I guess I look at it maybe slightly differently. And I, my goal for myself is to is to kind of 
make those two things almost one and the same to kind of, uh, so that they're not distinguishable, um, and to kind of expand my category of, of art to entirely fill up my category of faith, you know, so that you can't really tell where one ends and the other begins. Um, you know, in a project like this, for example, uh, like I was saying, I, you know, I, I approach it as uh, almost like a spiritual discipline, uh, you know, a way to meditate on the text. Uh, so certainly it was, a, it was an art project, it was done in public for other people to see, I've, I've got it hanging in a gallery, I had you know, a photographer and a filmmaker following me around, so, so there's a public side to it, but you know, really at the heart, it's, it's um, at least my goal and what I'm working towards more and more is to make, is to make my work as an artist uh, indistinguishable from my faith, or you know, one and the same. And, um, you know, the beauty of that is, uh, I mean, I'm all, I'm all about simplifying my to-do list, right? So, you know, if, you're, if your category of, of, of art is the same as your category of faith, which is the same as your category of life, you know, you've, you're left with only one thing to do, and that's live, you know? <laughs> and so, I, and I, I don't think that's a new idea. I think that's kind of as old as, as Christianity itself, and, and probably older, that, you know, you want it all to, to be together as one thing, and, and Jesus came to, to give us life, you know, and, and so uh, not, to, not to diminish all the complexities of, of life that there are, but certainly, you know, life under Christ um, can encompass all of those things into one, one nice whole thing. So that's, that's what I'm working towards, you know, I'm not sure how that all kind of will work out, but that's, that's my goal. That's great. I, you've said a number of times now that you did not come as a teacher. Um, but we've been inspired by your work, Gene. Uh, you're teaching us things. Uh, scripture also says that they'll know that we're Christians by our love. Um, your love for your father, your love for people, your love for creativity, uh, it's been very moving, and it's moved us as a community. Uh, so for you bringing your work here, uh, for Alicia bringing her work on campus, uh, I'd like to ask you audience to join me in just saying thanks. Upendo hauna mwisho. Lakini penye unabii utakoma. Zikiwemo lugha zitakoma. Yakiwemo maalifa yatakwisha. Kwa maana tunafahamu kwa sehemu na tunafanya unabii kwa sehemu. Lakini ukiwa maalifa utakapokuja yale asiyo kamili yatakwisha. overseas in Cyprus. My parents were with open doors with Brother Andrew. Coming here, I, I wondered at this, this campus that was known for sending missionaries out across the globe. And I used to go to, to Blanchard Hall and I would stand up there at the, the missionary wall and I would look at the names listed from the decades that have passed who have gone on to missions. And I wondered to the Lord, uh, would you send me again? Would you send me out? And within a few months, I was ready to go. I thought I had come to um, a bubble of homogenous Christianity that was a little bit on the stifling side for me at the time. But I discovered that 
um, that God had purpose for me to be here. And 20 years later, as he is well capable of doing, he's kept me in this community to be a part of what he's doing in bringing the global diaspora of peoples from across the globe into our own communities here in the Wheaton area. And over the last 20 years, Wheaton, um, you can cue up the slide here, Wheaton has, has changed in pretty dramatic ways. Um, if you look at this slide um, developed by the Billy Graham Center, the demographics of our county from 1970 on to 1980 and 1990, this was about the time when I came, was 1990. Um, now into 2010, there's 29.3% of our county here now is uh, non-white. And projected out, if you look at 2020 and 2030, now there will be a majority minority by the year 2030. That's a conservative projection, and the expectation is that um, we could reach that quite sooner. That's 20 years ahead of the national trend. Go to the next slide. In our county, we also have the second largest Hindu temple in North America. Next slide. Uh, the Glen Ellen Mosque, some of you may know this, over on 53. Next slide. Anybody recognize this building over on um, Hill Road, Hill Avenue, where the Romanian Missionary Society used to be? This is now a Turkish cultural center that is um, made up of missionaries who have been sent over to Muslim missionaries who have been sent here to reach Muslims in our community. Let's go to the next slide. Actually, let's back up here. In just a moment, I'll share, you, share with you a, a video clip from um, a conference that I'm helping to lead. But for the last 12 years, I've worked with World Relief in, a, in, a, in an organization where we're committed to equipping local churches to reach out across cultural barriers, across barriers of class, anything that divides us and to equip for the purpose of loving and the purpose of reaching out. And so my role has been to invite pastors and to invite churches in neighborhoods within just a stone's throw of this community right here to build relationships across those lines. And so now we have pastors and teams involved in mission right here in our community, not as missionary targets per se, but as neighbors living among neighbors. So seven years ago, we started a conference called the Mission on Our Doorsteps Conference. Um, it's a conference for the Chicagoland area that's focused on equipping the body of Christ to love our neighbor as ourselves. And here's a trailer that I want you to see for the conference that's coming this weekend. Kwanza mimi nilipofika hapa America niliwaza mimi sina ndugu sina jirani si, yani sina nini you have people in the page that are, are coming from all over the world so it's amazing how the page has been changing and so for us here who are seeing God at work here and bringing people into our neighborhood who may not be exactly like us it's a test for us I can say that I see the acceptance or sometimes the rejection of others. There's no way you can be a true believer of Jesus Christ if you don't love somebody in spite of their culture or ethnic identities. My hope is that we will open up our eyes and see that God is moving today. Maybe before, this was a place where we, will, we were sending people to all over the world. And now God is bringing the whole world here. So we need to ask the question, why is God doing this? What is it? And maybe fundamentally, we actually need to go back to God is doing this. This is part of his purpose, part of his plan. 
And we look at uh, this slide here from Acts chapter 17. We see from one man, God made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Now, one of the dynamics in our community is it's not just for <clears throat> those of us, let's say, who've been living in DuPage County for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, but it's also a part of God's plan is to bring other nations here also to love our neighbors and to reach out cross-culturally. Two friends of mine that I want to introduce you to briefly is uh, Emmanuel Tahir. Some of you may know him. Uh, he's been in the community for many years now. He's actually a missionary from Ethiopia to the U.S. He's one of College Church's missionaries, just right across the street over here. And he's been a part of planting churches, immigrant churches in our community. Pastor Yenner Wanti and his wife have been in the Wheaton area, planted a church um, that meets at College Church, uh, the Liberian Fellowship. And they have gone on to plant more churches in um, Western Illinois and on into Iowa. And now they're exploring other states where they may ch plant churches as well. Missionaries who are coming now to a place where Traditionally, we sent missionaries out. God is doing something new and amazing in our community. And this is not an anomaly. There are 150 immigrant churches in DuPage County alone. So what we see now, and what I see as a student who came 20 years ago to this community, is that our mission is not just about those of us who've been here reaching out, but it's about every person in God's family, reaching out, loving, and welcoming those who are coming from other nations. So what can we do now? I would just encourage you to um, consider thinking and looking and finding those people in your community who are different than you. Those people who are in your, your workplaces, those people that you meet at the grocery store or the gas station, greet them. Welcome them. Spend time getting to know them. Your life will be enriched, and certainly theirs will as well. But embrace these changes in our communities as God-given. We have to stand on that reality. And come to this weekend to the, the Mission on Our Doorsteps conference. Uh, we'd love to have you there Friday and Saturday. There's actually two tickets being raffled off over in the gallery. So for any students who would like to go, you can just enter your name in the raffle. We'd love to see you there. God bless. Ketika aku kanak-kanak, aku berkata-kata seperti kanak-kanak. Aku merasa seperti kanak-kanak. Aku berpikir seperti kanak-kanak. Sekarang sesudah aku menjadi dewasa, aku meninggalkan sifat kanak-kanak itu. Karena sekarang kita melihat dalam cermin suatu gambaran yang semar-semar, tetapi nanti kita akan melihat muka dengan muka. Sekarang aku hanya mengenal dengan tidak sempurna, tetapi nanti akan-akan mengenal dengan sempurna, seperti aku sendiri dikenal. Demi kenyanlah, tinggal ketiga hal ini, yaitu iman, pengharapan, dan kasih. Dan yang, yang paling besar di antaranya ialah kasih.
Well, good evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is David McNutt, and I'm an adjunct professor here at Wheaton College in the Biblical and Theological Studies Department. I teach uh, systematic theology and a little bit of historical theology, but my particular area of interest uh, is uh, the relationship, I'll say relationship, uh, Gene, not intersection, of theology and the arts. So no uh, gridlock or uh, accidents, let's hope. Uh, just the relationship between theology and the arts. And uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here with all of you and all the members of our panel uh, this evening uh, as we discuss uh, the relationship between the gospel, art, and the community in Love Town in Our Town. As we were just reminded uh, a moment ago uh, in the reading from 1 Corinthians in Indonesian, no less, the chapter concludes with an affirmation that while the virtues of faith, hope, and love each abide, the greatest of these is love. So tonight, over the next little while here, we'll have an opportunity to discuss what it means to exhibit this greatest virtue of love in our relationship with others, how Wheaton College may exemplify love within the broader Wheaton community, and the role that the arts may perhaps surprisingly serve in making uh, this possible. But first, let me uh, introduce uh, the members of our panel discussion. Uh, first, Dr. Lon Allison. Uh, Dr. Allison is the executive director of the Billy Graham Center here on the college's campus. He's also an associate professor of evangelism and leadership in the Wheaton College Graduate School. And among the many other uh, positions that he fills, he's also the vice chair of the U.S. Lausanne Committee for World Evangelization. Dr. Allison, great to have you here this evening. Thank you so much. Professor Leah Samuelson uh, attended and graduated from Wheaton College uh, as an undergraduate. Uh, and she's now here as a visiting instructor of art in the art department. Uh, and she has uh, extensive experience and expertise in community art. So I'm very glad that she's here this evening. Great to have you here. Thanks so much. <laughs> pastor Hannibal Rodriguez is the teaching pastor at Iglesia del Pueblo, the Hispanic congregation uh, that meets at Wheaton Bible Church. He's a first generation Hispanic and immigrated to the United States in 2000. So great to have you here, Hannibal. Thank you very much for coming. And finally, Mr. Michael Gresk. Uh, Mr. Gresk is the mayor of the city of Wheaton, a position he's held since 2007, and he's had various other uh, positions in uh, public service prior to that. He's also the assistant vice president of Providence uh, Bank, and among the many other roles that he filled, he, uh, he's also served on the board of directors at St. Michael's Catholic School. So thank you, Mayor Gresk. Great to have you here this evening. So I wanted to begin, actually, uh, with Professor Samuelson. So uh, we have, uh, yes. Let's start with uh, the art department. So uh, your interest in community art has taken you around the world, uh, but you've also been involved in the Philadelphia-based Build, Build a Bridge project, uh, for which you made community murals, murals, and you've trained other people in mural making. So I thought a good way to start this might be just, to, you know, for those of us who aren't familiar with this, okay. just to give us a definition so we know what we're talking about of community art. You know, I think we've seen a great example of that, but. Can you, from your you know, expertise and experience, just explain for us, what is community art? Okay, I think the long definition includes three things. Community art is a life-affirming strategic process of gathering around a project in order to collectively plan, execute, and celebrate a creative vision. The short way of saying that is it's art plus people. That's not short. Yeah, that's not yeah. <laughs> I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> so what in your mind makes Lovetown, maybe you could detail that a little bit for us, um, what makes Lovetown an example of community art? The, the sentence that comes to mind in, when community art is flowing is, is the beautiful question of people asking each other, what's your idea? So I don't know if I've ever seen a more poignant example of an invitation to a community to say, here's my idea. I'm here. What's your idea? It's in that question of saying, I can host you to my idea. I'd love to be the guest to what's your creative vision. Mm -hmm. it, it perpetuates that. Mm -hmm. Are there other things about it that make it stand out from other forms of community art? Obviously, you know, you've seen a lot of examples of that. You've, been, you, you've seen examples of that around the world. So, uh, and you mentioned, I think, a little bit about that sort of invitation. Mm -hmm. Anything else that strikes you about the project, though, that makes it stand out from other forms of or other examples of community art? 
The biggest difference between uh, regular art and community art is the identity of the audience. So when the community is your audience and they're viewing the art in their own context, that's when you're starting to really get into the community. Mm -hmm. um, the, the location, I, I really like what Jean said about life. The location for the art is life, the reason for the art of life, and the viewers of the art are the people living life right there. Mm -hmm. So if you notice, where was this installation? All over the community. I was actually talking with Gene just before um, the program tonight, and he mentioned how, you know, given the negative space that he uses with the letters, that in a way the community is the text, you know, that it is speaking uh, through the letters. So thank you, Professor Samuelson. Um, Dr. Allison, I want to ask you next. Uh, you know, your passion for global evangelism is taking you, like Professor Samuelson, around the world. Uh, but this particular project highlights some of the things uh, that we've already heard a little bit about this evening. It highlights, I think, one of the ways that mission can be a very local reality and activity. So I'm wondering, from your perspective, how does a project like Lovetown inform our understanding of what it means to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, or what it means to be a missionary? Well, I suppose uh, what I most value about Lovetown is the word, love. Um, that's what made the Billy Graham Center be interested in it. If we could communicate broader into our community from this campus, the love that we have for the community, the desire to engage with the community, but even more, we want to get God's love into the community because he is the ultimate lover. 1 Corinthians 13 describes the love that he offers, uh, but in his life he embodied it. So when we talk about art, uh, Jesus was a master artist. Uh, his art was spoken art, and he was a storyteller. And the stories that he told about the love of God for a, for a broken world need to be told everywhere. So visual art, performance art, spoken art, acted art, even danced art at Wheaton College, I'm all for it. As long as it gets the love of God into the community. Thank you, that's great. Good. <laughs> Check, all right. <laughs> Mayor Gresk, I wanted to ask you, you know, you have uh, lived in and out of Wheaton for nearly 40 years, and uh, so you're very familiar with the community and the relationship between Wheaton College and the broader Wheaton community. So I was just wondering if you could offer for us, you know, uh, well, how would you describe that relationship, and how do you think that relationship might be helped or enriched by a project like Lovetown? The uh, apologies for anyone who's heard this speech before. Um, the college and the city grew up together. Uh, in fact, if memory serves, I believe our, our first village president was also on your board of trustees, was, the, uh, was Warren Wheaton, and indeed helped bring Jonathan Blanchard to this city to, to found and, and start the college, start, and, and to start Wheaton College. Um, and I, the sense that I have is that that relationship has grown and matured and ebbed and regrown and rematured um, as, as Wheaton has uh, over the last 150 years, 180 years since we were founded. Um, I saw this as an opportunity when I was approached by, uh, by the college, uh, by Eric, to, to, to come and participate in this. Um, I, was, I, I was very much impressed and moved and happy and maybe a little intimidated also uh, to come and speak. Um, but I think, I think the relationship between the college and the city can only be improved by the Lovetown Project. We have an incredible base of volunteers in this community, and I, and I don't necessarily limit that to the church groups and to, and, and to the uh, 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 ancillary uh, publishing houses and, and the uh, uh, the, not, not necessarily the religious-based organizations, but I, I would also include uh, the other various service clubs we have in town. We have a very, very active service base um, that I think can only serve to be improved by this, um, you know, by this project. And uh, when, when, when it, as I said, when I was first approached by it, uh, about it, I, 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 I only see it doing good, better for Wheaton. We have an incredibly 
vibrant volunteer base of people who love their community. And, and a project such as this can only bring awareness you know, to that level. Um, you know, reading through it, words, words that I hadn't run across since uh, college philosophy, theology days. Um, we, have, we have that brotherly style of love, the philia, uh, but, the, but the agape, that, that I think we can inspire people to reach out, whether they realize they're doing it or not, I think you can inspire a community to that level to bring, bring their actions, bring their actions, bring their iliomacenary activities to the forefront and, and, you know, and make Wheaton better. It was a revelation to me uh, when, you know, when I heard that, you know, the, the idea of a, of a uh, missionary going out has been kind of reversed. Uh, God, when Mr. Schrader was up here, you know, he said that, you know, the immigrants are coming here now. Um, and I'm quite, you know, quite honestly, from a community standpoint, quite pleased uh, to see the college looking inward to what we do as a community here. I mean, the role of the college in the evangelical global scene is indeed world famous to have that inward looking, and, and I think what's old is new again, I, th I think that was the original premise, one of the original premises too of the, of the college when, when, when Jonathan Blanchard came here to, to instill that faith in the community, instill that spirit in the community, and, and, and then I think this, this project will, as I say, what's old is new again, it's, it's gonna come 180 and we're back, or maybe 360, it, you know, back to what it, what it is, was uh, previously. Thank you. Pastor Rodriguez, I wanted to ask you, you know, um, I'm particularly glad that you could be here this evening as a representative of a particular segment uh, within the community, and I'm thinking of, you know, all of the pastors uh, in the community, all of the churches uh, that make up such a vibrant uh, and lively part of uh, the broader Wheaton community here. I'm wondering if you could just, uh, for a moment, tell us a little bit about uh, the experience of your community in the Wheaton, West Chicago, West Chicago, Carroll Stream area. I have no idea. <laughs> it's it's um, one of the things that we were dealing with in, in our congregation, our church is uh, we're so used to being a church that it's all about come and see what we do and come and hear our message, which is all good and it's great. But I think that one of the things that God was calling us to do is we wanted to make a switch between or we want to change uh, uh, between being a come and see church to go and tell and do church, which is two different things. And um, I think when you put it together about loving your neighbor, is that's exactly what, what we wanted to do. Instead of waiting for people to come to us, we wanted to do something that, um, that would change that. So having our worship service on Sunday is still a very important thing for us. It's, it's our best day. But uh, during the week, we wanted to do something else because we, we wanted to love our neighbor. Uh, one of the little the, the, the changes that we made is that we created this uh, something that we call community groups, which is uh, it, it's a mix between a Bible study cell um, and a midweek service, and um, we decided to establish some of those in the community. So um, about seven months ago, we started. We already had one at church. We started one in West Chicago. In in a, there's this residential area that's called Timber Lake. Uh, they have about 2,000 people living there. So we, by God's grace, we started a Bible study there. And the community owned their community. So it's not only that they meet to, uh, for a Bible study and prayer and things like that, but they're very interested in transforming uh, their community, whatever it means you know, it's needed. Uh, by God's grace, again, uh, about two months ago, we, we had the opportunity to open another one in Franklin Park. Uh, it's always the mentality of how is, it, how is it that we can love our neighbors? Not only so they could come and hear the gospel, but in a way that they could, all, in a way that they could see it and taste it with us being there. So that's kind of the idea. That's great. Thanks. Let me ask you a follow-up. Uh, you know, it's, I'm sure it comes as no surprise to you or to many here that the arts have often been a very contentious issue in the history of the church. I mean, from the earliest Christians to the iconoclast controversies of the 8th and 9th century to the various responses of the reformers in the 16th century to today's sometimes ongoing worship wars within church. How have the arts played a, or what role, I guess, have they played within uh, your particular community and your worshiping community? Um, 
if I think of that question from my cultural point of view, arts has always been a major thing for us, especially in the arts of, in, 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 a, in when we talk about music, for example. You know, if, if you have a Hispanic church and there's no music, that's not a church, that, that's something else. Um, so in that sense, uh, if you will, church and art has always been together for us culturally. But as I was looking at this video and as I heard this and I saw this, uh, there's so many more things that we could do, not only in terms of uh, music, but everything else that we could do. Um, one, of, one of the things that we struggle with as a Hispanic congregation, uh, for example, is that our first generation Hispanics in the, in the United States are, is not a congregation that is, is appreci if you will, yeah, appreciates arts too much. But our second generation and third generation Hispanics do. So as we think of that, um, thinking about probably doing something together in which we could combine these two things, in, you know, having these community groups that are reaching and serving our community and at the same time bringing these together will be an amazing, an amazing thing. That's great, thank you. For Mr. Samuelson, I wanna come back to you. Um, you know, there's kind of this conception of an artist. Right? What is an artist, what makes an artist? Uh, and I think for many people, the view is that the artist is an individual working on their own, isolated from the rest of society, slaving away, trying to express their personal vision to others. And that corresponds to some of the things that you talked about earlier about community art kind of expressing a vision, but how does this kind of art just challenge our understandings of what an artist is? Yes, please challenges us to broaden our definition of what an artist is because what you've described is certainly an artist mm -hmm. and what what we'd like to do is have those artists participate with other people because we've got a goal in mind of uh, rest, restoring ourselves restoring our communities and I'll come I'm coming back around to your question <laughs> we all we all agree that this should happen should the arts be included? Yes. Is this an amazing opportunity for the community to come together? Yes, this should happen. Then we ask how, and crickets start chirping. Nobody, oh, how, how do we get together? What should we do? The people who know how to make art need to come into the community and say, through rehearsing this process of creativity together, we can become more whole more effective people who are capable of participating in making a life worth living. We need to see ourselves do it creatively. So we, we need our artists and we need more people who are willing to engage in the arts because coming together is really the goal. That's the heavenly goal is coming together. And the arts bring us together. They create a safe place to explore. I think that for some people, art can seem kind of daunting. You know, but when I for even artists, yeah. Yeah, but you know, for you know, you know, when Eric was talking about, for example, the sweatshirts that were being made, mm -hmm. that seems more manageable, I think, to most people. Yeah, and it's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. You you want to get that relationship started, and then, Dr. McNutt, the next thing you do together, and that's the key. The next thing you do together is a little bit better, and somebody else says, "Well, what about if we try it this way?" We say, "Okay, what happens?" And then it's a little bit better. And then another professional artist comes in and says, well, you know, I've been working on this for 20 years and you could try this. And it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, it is a non-daunting beginning. And think of where we can go. Think of how, how great of a life we can create together when we work, when we work to creatively problem solve. You, and you start manageably. Mm -hmm. And you, you expand from there. You start with a sweatshirt. You start with a sweatshirt. Great. Dr. Allison, I wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. um, as you have been observing and interacting with this project, uh, how has it spoken to you, the truth of the gospel? When I walked in the building this morning, the uh, 1 Corinthians 13 was against the side wall right outside here. And for me, as more of an um, oral communicator, artist. Mm -hmm. I just stood and I made my eyes do the whole scan of the wall, reading every one of those words uh, to myself. And um, 
I thought, how astounding is the kind of love this is talking about. I, I think I want to press that, that we press not only about art, but the, mm -hmm. the art of expression of love, which is what got us all into this project. Um, and, and so when I was reading those words, I go, that is really true. And I go, boy, I sure don't live that way. And so uh, art has the power to inspire. It has the power to convict. And so that art convicted me, especially around the theme of what is godly love. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, how long are we up here? A little while. And do I get to talk anymore? Yeah, I'll, get, I'll, okay. I'll give it to you. I'll just, yeah, just 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm not sure. Um, I just... The, the, the text that we're using and the, and the portraits that are displaying love and loss out there, uh, I guess those of us at the college hope that our friends from the community who have <laughs> stepped in here tonight would know that with all our hearts we want you to know that love, and we want to say we don't live it out either. We fall short all the time, but that there was one who did live it out. And... Uh, I called him an artist a few moments ago, and then I thought, oh, Phil Riken's going to get on me about that one, because Jesus is a lot more than artist. He, and Phil will probably lead us to this anyway. Jesus demonstrates the love mm -hmm. in that while we were yet unlovable, mm -hmm. he loved us. So mm -hmm. I, I just want to make an appeal to everybody. Look what the art is saying. Look what the art is depicting, and it's telling the story of a God of mammoth love for all of us. And that's what the college wants you to know tonight. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, Gresk, I wanted to come back to you and ask you, um, you know, in your time in Wheaton, and in particular as, uh, in, you know, in your time as mayor, what connections have you witnessed people making sort of across communities, between communities, communities that might not, not always interact, uh, even within Wheaton? What connections have you seen people making across something like the arts or some other activity? The, uh, I, I, I'm trying to think of best examples that um, of, of people reaching out from their, you know, at times insular world, to um, to touch other 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 aspects of the community. Um, I know, as in, in my role as mayor, I, people people say, you know, what's what's the best part about being mayor? And I go, everybody wants to talk to you. It, uh, and in that capacity. Um, I've had the occasion to visit uh, you, uh, one of the slideshows. Uh, had uh, the uh, the APS, uh, the Hindu temple, out in Bartlett. I visited there. I was there. Uh, I was there. Uh, actually, it was right after I was elected. Before I took office, it was the 100th anniversary, and I met the Maharishi. And it was it was very. My son Jeffrey and I went uh, went out there, you know, by invitation because everybody wants to talk to the mayor. Um, and and I saw that th within that community. Um, a, just an incredible level of pride um, and, a, and, a, and a need to reach out. That's why they invited me. Uh, a need to reach out. Uh, you see, that was pretty humbling, too. There's, there's 5,000 people in the audience, um, men in the front, women in the back. 5,000 5, people in the audience, and um, they asked me to address them. And it's like, okay, this is, I've been, I've been mayor now about 10 minutes. So, <laughs> so we can't speak from experience. What do we do? What do we do? Um, <laughs> But that, you know, back to your question, uh, uh, Dave, the idea, uh, I, th I think that the pride that I see in, in those et particularly ethnic communities where they want to reach out and make sure that you come back. I mean, they were quite keen, and I put a plug in for them. Uh, I'll give you a phone number later if you want to call. Um, they, they are keen to have people come out and visit and take the tours. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous building. It's, it's, it's quite a work of art. Um, that type of thing I saw, um, I, uh, I, I got a call about a year and a half ago uh, when the when the Sikh uh, Illinois Sikh community moved into Wheaton, the, they have a gurdwara on the south side of town. It's the old clubhouse from the uh, streams, which has been a church really for the last 20 years, and and they purchased that. And they're very very keen to come in the community. Once again, a very very happy people filled with pride uh, that want to reach out to the community. And and again, I think my role, uh, you know, you know, in that, if there is a role for the mayor, is to is to introduce those people to the community. It's my, it's my favorite answer to anything when anybody calls. Sure, you wanna to go to the Chamber of Commerce meeting? You wanna to go to Lions Club? Let's go. You know, just to get those faces out there, those people out there, and get them involved in the community. 
Um, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, 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 it works in, in sometimes quiet and strange ways. I, I, I don't think, uh, you know, it's not the, uh, uh, it, it's, it's not a broadcast type thing. It's not a, um, you know, they're not gonna shout it from the highest rooftops, but it's, it, it, it's very much what, what, uh, what Pastor Rodriguez was talking about, the idea of, of going out to the community and, and, and going out and touching them. And I see that from our people within our community, particularly the new ethnic groups coming in and wanting to be involved and wanting to do something to help. I know the, I know the Sikhs were, uh, were keen to expand on their uh, public service and um, their kitchen where they, where they were you know, willing to feed people. It's, uh, it's, it, you know, it's quite an experience, it truly is. Thank you. Everybody wants to talk to the mayor. It's a great job, man. <laughs> Trust me. Pastor Rodriguez, um, now I, I want to come back to the church. Obviously, within the church, the word, and by that I mean, obviously, first and foremost, Jesus Christ, the word of God incarnate, but also, obviously, the word of Scripture. This is fundamental to the life, the existence, the worship of the church. As I look at Love Town, it seems to me to be a wonderful joining together an embodiment of word and image. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how this project might both encourage and challenge the church. And taking your own congregation, but also I mean, the church broadly. How does something like this both encourage us, but also challenge us? You know, when I, when I, when I think about the world, um, what Jesus came to do, and what he's doing, and at the end of the day, what he's going to do. Uh, I, I, I see not only the process of sanctification for us, uh, but I see the process of restoration. And I think that uh, the, one of the best ways for us to bring restoration to the world, if we, if we, if, you know, to see it, if bringing heaven to earth and putting word and image together, um, this specific type of art will do that. Will, will bring beauty into a community. Mm -hmm. uh, as I was looking at those pictures, in my mind is thinking, if we were to do that in West Chicago, if we were to do that in Kerry Stream, if we were to do that in Franklin Park, uh, that would add so much beauty to our community. Uh, some of the pictures that I saw outside, uh, yeah, the word love, and then you got these murals on, on, on the side. Uh, if these murals send a, a, um, a biblical message, a message of the gospel and, and Jesus' love and how much he's willing to die for people, if you see all of that stuff in, a, in an image, that will bring so much to our community. That will bring so much restoration, if you will, into our community. Um, I think that the church is called to bring that too. Uh, I think that we're called to do that. Uh, I don't mean to say that we have to diminish word. The word has to be there. It's the first thing, in my, in my opinion, uh, that is the, the first thing. But it doesn't mean that we can't put this into this. I think that we could do that. Um, the reason why I say that is because everybody else is doing it. They're just sending a different message. Uh, our challenge as, ch as churches and as pastors is to make sure that we actually bring in beauty to the community. The, the beauty of the gospel is shown in, a, in an image. Uh, and anything else, that'll be it. That's great, thank you. Now I wanted to ask each of you um, a bit about your vision. And I, th I thought it was really appropriate that Eric asked Gene about his sort of vision. So for each of you, I have a, I have a question about sort of your, your hopes or your vision for something. So first, for Professor Samuelson, uh, what's your vision for the role that community art can and should have both in the, the community of the college and in the broader community, a place like Wheaton? That's a slow one. I like things that move slowly. So you have to kind of extrapolate this vision a couple hundred years or whatever you like. You can't force someone to believe something. So my vision has a request in it. That please believe, <coughs> please believe that um, your contribution makes my contribution better, and my contribution makes your contribution better to this community that we're living in. I want to live in a place with us that we all made together. So please believe that that's possible, and please believe that I can't do it without you, and please don't do it without me. <laughs> so I, I want to be there, and I want to be together. And I can't say what that looks like because I haven't talked to everybody yet. So my vision would be at first to have, let's communicate on that. 
go to that one. Yeah. And Dr. Allison, uh, your vision, what's your vision for the ways that the Bill Graham Center specifically, Wheaton College more broadly, might love its, its neighbor and continue to spread the good news of Jesus Christ? What's your vision for that? We at the Graham Center um, have sought to provide the Museum of Evangelism as a place for everybody to come that wants to come, free of charge. They can give a donation if they want, but it tells a wonderful story. And then through the leadership of people like Eric, we have incredible art that we bring in all the time. So we try to create almost on this first floor over there in the museum, David, we've tried to create almost a sacred space. And one of the gifts we're seeking to bring is a place where there's quiet and stillness for people in a very, very loud world. Mm -hmm. And I have so many different people that Eric will tell me that come through and they love the stillness and the soft music that plays. And so I think that's a gift we're trying to give through mm -hmm. the museum there. Um, beyond that, I don't know. I was thinking what Michael was talking about with the Sikh temple in the south side of town. Uh, we just had a wonderful Sikh family move into our neighborhood. And uh, it was so much fun inviting them to come to our neighborhood Christmas party. Uh, because first of all, they decorate their house really well at Christmas. I was proud of them. Lots of lights, multiple colors. And, th and then they came to our house and they began, th we've been teaching them Western board games. And then we tried to make chai for them. Uh, and didn't do so well. And when we did, they said they wanted coffee. Uh, <laughs> but one of, I suppose one of the great joys we have is when newcomers to our community, and we still are dominantly Caucasian, so anytime we can open our homes and open our school to, to the wonderful ethnicity uh, that's all about us as people, it's just such a great gift. So maybe I'm talking more about Marie, what Marie and I want to give to our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. but. Um, yeah, and they brought us popcorn. It was really neat. And uh, we love them, Ravi and his wife. So that we, we give away. You know, there is something wonderful, and I'll stop with this. We can be culturally so distant from one another. But again, when it comes back to the longing for love, mm -hmm. the need for the love, and even the wanting to give love, there's a commonness to humanity. And of course, I think that spark goes back to the way that the one God who made us all placed that in us. Mm -hmm. It's fun to discover that. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. I know. So Mayor Gresk, uh, your vision, what's your vision for the ongoing relationship between Wheaton College and the broader Wheaton community? I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I see this as a fantastic opportunity to tap into the resources, uh, particularly manpower, um, women and woman power too. That, that, that the college can afford to us as a, you know, as a community. Um, I, I address a lot of groups. I talk to a lot of people individually. We have a plethora of Cub Scout troops that come through the city all the time, and I, and I love them, and there's some funny stories there, too. But the, the idea of, uh, of your involvement in the community, and I'm going to extend that same invitation. I extend to anybody else, too. Um, we have myriad vacancies, opportunities to serve on city commissions. Um, and basically, 18 years old and you live in town, um, go to the city's website, which is my favorite answer to everything, wheaton.il.us, and, and, you know, and check it out. I'm looking out here now. I recognize a few people. Jan is here, and uh, Bill is uh, Bill's involved with our, as, a, as a volunteer with our Center for History. Uh, Trent is on historic commission from the city of Wheaton. I don't know if I miss anybody. It's always dangerous when you start pointing people out because somebody's going to say, oh, you forgot me. Sorry, if I forgot you, you're still out there. I know that. And I want to extend that invitation and tap into the resources that are the college, and that's staff and students, too. Um, as, as I, I, I've been invited back the last few years to address the incoming freshman class. Um, you know, you're here. This is home for four years, and I cannot tell you. I suppose I could if I counted them. Uh, the number of people, couples, married couples in this town that, you know, she's from Boston, he's from Seattle, and pff, they went to Wheaton College, and here's a shocker, they settle in Wheaton. What a great testimony to our community. Don't laugh, you will. I see your students laughing. <laughs> Don't laugh, you will. Oh, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, you would. Yeah, you would. Trust me, you will. 
<laughs> um, I, I think if we could see a real, we will see a, a, a positive influence from this where um, that, that energy that is part and parcel of Eaton College has been for 150 years uh, can be channeled okay. yeah, out, in, out into the immediate community. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing that you're doing here today, as I said, with, you know, what's old is new again, and this is all good. Pastor Rodriguez, I wanted to uh, give you the hard question. So I wanted to ask you your vision uh, for how we might love our neighbor. Actually, that's, that's not a hard question. Um, I think that we're called to live among the people and preach the word and beautify, and beautify our neighborhood. Um, and when I say beautify, I mean art and social justice, if I will. And all of this kind of stuff that the Bible calls us to do. And if we do that, then we are fulfilling what God called us to do. And that's our vision. Thank you. In the spirit of um, the project and the sort of collaboration that's been going on, you know, I wanted to give you guys an opportunity you know, I've been asking all of the questions. I wanted to give you an opportunity maybe to ask questions of each other uh, for a few minutes. Uh, is there something that you, know, that you wanted to ask uh, one of the other members of the panel here sort of in the course of the few conversations that we've had or maybe having seen, uh, you know, interacted with uh, the project here? Any questions that you had for each other? No, I have one. And it's for, and it's for me, it's for some of us that are here. How, how would you, if I were to put you in the spotlight right now, and I'll say, uh, I, I want to do a project with you. What would you suggest? How can we start this? What can we do? Oh, it starts with a visit. I like the popcorn story. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to eat popcorn? Yeah. Yeah. I know what I'm getting her for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> you, you visit, you invite somebody, like you just said. I invite you to come. And then I come and I say, what, what, what do you like? What's happening here? Somebody has an idea. The world is not short of ideas. They're, they're in there. Um, we find it, and we start to plan around it, and we try something. So it, it's as easy as a conversation. If you show up and be in the same place at the same time, if somebody is the host and somebody is the guest, and you ask this question, something, something will come out. I would not come and say, Here's the project for you. I planned it in Los Angeles. I tried it out in Houston, and it will work for you. I would say we've done a lot of different things. There's a lot of great ideas out there. I've got about 500. Um, what do you think? And then, then we put them together. I would start with asking a beautiful question. It, w it, it will not fail. The, the passion is in there. I have a question for uh, the mayor, Michael. Are, uh, are we, as the college, are we perceived as friendly and wanting to be engaged in the community, or is there any sense of separation, anything we might be portraying that we don't know that we are? We talked about this a little bit at, uh, at the lunch we had uh, last week. I, I think there is a perception that you know, it is, it is the place on the hill, both metaphorically and actually. And what happens at the college doesn't really impact the city, which is, you know, simply not true. Um, we uh, remember a discussion I had with Dr. Lipton about eight or 10 years ago, where he detailed painstakingly uh, the impact the college has, has on the city. And I think, and maybe it's because we are so much larger now than we were 150 years ago, there's a big duh, but, and people are much more transient than they are, uh, than they used to be. People are much more transient now. They come in, they will stay two and three years. To have people that have lived in town two and three generations is, is not unusual in this town, and I, I doubt that that's unique. I mean, there, there's other places that do it too, but, I, but you know, Lon, back to your question, um, I think that is a, 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 uh, you know, a perception that, yeah, it's nice we got the college here, fine. 
And okay, yeah, they have a lot in payroll, they pay a lot of money to their, or they spend a lot of money in our town, the kids do, and it's parents weekend and they're coming in and okay, good, the restaurants are filled, isn't that nice? But hopefully something like, like this, like the Lovetown Project, will, will inspire that involvement. And, and quite honestly, I, and we talked about this too, I've noticed just in the last, well, I, coincidentally since I became mayor because I noticed more things then, I think, but the, uh, the attitude of the college towards the community also. Yeah. You see uh, more of the college people involved in the Chamber of Commerce, uh, in, the, in, the, you know, in the Lions Club. Um, um, you know, I, uh, I, I think the college becoming involved in the community, and we spoke, Dr. Reich and I spoke casually about uh, perhaps something the college could do at the 4th of July Parade, which is a huge uh, event in town. I mean, it, it, it transcends the town. There's 40, 50,000 people yeah. that, not, not, uh, you know, the line of, if there's some activity, some sponsorship the college could do, I think, I think that would go a long way in this reaching out. I mean, it, it, that, that whole outreach or reaching out that can be done here, obviously it's on a personal level, uh, you know, uh, you know, get involved in the communities. Uh, I, I know the Rotary Club has a, has a, uh, they have a different name for it. The college level, Rotaract, I forget exactly what it's called, but it's, it's the college and the city becoming involved at a, you know, in a, at, at a very immediate level. Um, I know a few years back, I don't know if it's still active or not, the, there was a group of the college kids working with the Canical Ministries um, out at the Wheaton Franciscans. Uh, they have a ministry which is AIDS, HIV orientated, and in that realm, the college had a, had a, had a group of kids, a group of students that were regular uh, attendees at uh, at one of the uh, uh, transitional housing uh, uh, projects uh, that, uh, that the Franciscans do out, you know, you know, you know out at Aurora. Um, I, I think if you could take that fervor, that passion, that fire that Wheaton College is famous for globally and focus, you know, within a three mile range, yeah. I mean, it's, it, you know, it can happen. But again, back to your question, I, th I think there is a goodly amount of I don't think it's apathy. I think it's ambivalence, perhaps. Ambivalence. Oh, yeah, there's a college here, too. That's right. Yeah, I remember that. Well, no, it's, it's, it's a lot more than that. We can work on that, Lon. Give me a call. Okay. We'll do breakfast. <laughs> okay. Popcorn. Popcorn, Popcorn. correct. Yeah. Popcorn. Popcorn. Uh, we'll have to stop there, but uh, the panel members will all be, all be available in the reception in the BGC Museum, which will immediately follow our event here. So would you all please join me in thanking uh, the members of our panel this evening? Let me give you four or five reasons to linger tonight. Uh, if you go out Barrows Auditorium and turn to your left and then kind of go to the right and keep going that direction, you have an opportunity to see the artistry of Gene Schmidt and Alicia Hansen. You're invited for refreshments, for conversation with our artists and panelists. Uh, there are opportunities to get postcards and posters and uh, prints of the artwork that some of which you've seen tonight. Uh, there is also a, a raffle for students uh, who may be interested in attending the Mission on Our Doorsteps uh, conference. And as we're dismissed tonight, I want to leave you with these questions. What is God calling me to make? With whom is he calling me to make it? And most importantly, who is the person God is calling me to love? Thank you for being here tonight. You're dismissed. <laughs>